identifies him as the father of, of uh, cruise missiles, the Tomahawk at, uh, at Convair, uh, where m many of us that are here, I see in the audience, uh, worked at Convair. Um, Bob will tell you when he joined Convair, you know, what I consider the golden age of Convair. I didn't uh, join, actually it was uh, astronautics when I joined in 1963. Um, in the 60s, almost everything I worked on was paper kind of studies for Bob. So I first met him, uh, working with him and, and for him, um, on what uh, became the uh, space shuttle. We were in competition for the space shuttle uh, flyback booster, and unfortunately we lost that. And they had a big team of folks uh, looking for something to do, and we were assigned, and this was in 1972. It, it's uh, nostalgic that uh, this year is the uh, will be in October, September, October, the 40th anniversary of the start of the cruise missile program at Condor. Hard to believe, time flies when you've been having fun. Um, so we went from working on a 200 foot more or less um, uh, space shuttle booster to a 20 foot um, cruise missile. Uh, a team of us got it started and uh, it's still going as Bob will, will explain the whole, the whole process. But he was uh, for his uh, tenure there through the the 80s, the chief engineer, technical Jerry, director. Eat the mic. Get it close. Okay. Yeah. All right. Better. Well, that's that's enough by way of introduction. Uh, uh, Bob uh, is going to explain the process we went through when we when we got started uh, with a a fairly small team of people who uh, over those 20 odd years grew to. Uh, uh, at the peak, we probably had over a thousand engineers working on cruise missile programs, um, both up at Kearney Mesa and down at uh, Lindbergh Field, and even at Plant 19, where we did one of the variants. Um, so we were, we were spread out. Unfortunately, it's all moved over to Tucson, where it's now under um, the uh, ownership and management of the Raytheon Company. Uh, General Dynamics uh, got out of the, of the defense business in the early 90s and, and they moved everything that we were doing over to Tucson where it still uh, exists and is still in production. Bob, why don't you take over here? Well, he, uh, he you're not going to get a... Uh, stipend from Electric Boat for saying that we're out of the defense business. <laughs> it's really in the defense business. Now this hat, I'm sorry to say, is, part, is one of the props for something I'm going to say, so I have to wear it during the whole event. Let's see. The main thing... is that I worked on Tomahawk, well, I worked at Convair from 1949 to 1986. So I did a lot of things before Tomahawk. And I worked on Tomahawk from 1973 till I retired in 86. That's a long time to be so-called chief engineer of a program and go all the way from a piece of paper with some pencil marks on it to uh, something that actually did what it was supposed to do and is still doing it. Okay, I'm going to use some very expensive very expensive presentation material. And what we have here is a, what was going to be a 21 foot drawing of the whole thing, but your boards are too small. I suggest you get a bigger board for bigger projects. <laughs> and uh, so the thing about it is, this torpedo tube in the submarine, I one day I 
asked the fellow, I said, say, how did it come to be the size it is? He says, oh, he says, that was Admiral Dewey, right after Manila Bay. He was in his cavern celebrating the victory in Manila Bay. And uh, in those days, you could drink in the Navy, so he was having a drink. And he said, oh, let's see, what would be a good dimension? 21 inches in diameter and 21 feet long. It's just right. So that's what we did from then on. And, of course, once the Navy starts something, they never change. The uh, <coughs> Japanese went to 18-inch torpedoes and a lot longer, and that was very disappointing to us, especially in Iron Bottom Sound. Okay, so here's the capsule. No, I, I'm saying this is the torpedo tube coming out here, and this is the... <coughs> This is the uh, 21 inch and the 21 feet. So that gives you an idea of how big it is. And uh, the vehicle, well first of all there's the, the capsule. The tomahawk is contained in a Stainless steel capsule, full length of the missile, and fits inside the torpedo tube, about 3 16th inch stainless steel. And you think, why in the world did we have to do that? Well, you'll learn a little bit about that in a minute. But uh, it's a, it was a beautiful thing, that capsule, stainless steel. The minute the sailors saw that, they got their polish out and began polishing that capsule. Sailors like to polish things. <clears throat> the only trouble was I come down to the dock on Point Loma one day and it was a tomahawk but it was green. Horrible green. They said, oh, the Admiral says we've got to paint everything green to match the torpedoes because we don't want anybody on the dock looking and seeing how many tomahawks we're putting in versus how many torpedoes. So that was the reason for that. All right, I'm having a hard time here because I need a 21 inch board. But the missile goes in the capsule and comes all the way back inside the tube to this point. That, that's the booster. We'll be talking about the booster again in a minute. But it fills the whole, the whole thing, as you might imagine, because the requirements for Tomahawk, there are about seven of them, which is pretty good, considering it was a Navy project. But there were two of them that really drove us, drove the whole program. And that was the range. They wanted at least 1,300 miles. And that's a long way for something to fly. And we made that. That's probably why we won the contract. And Jerry Butzko is the guy that made it do it. And uh, the other thing is shock. You guys just don't know anything about shock until you've been on a submarine that has been depth charged. And uh, we never could figure out quite what the level of shock was, but we kind of figured it out and used 200 G's lateral. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of G's for something that has to fly. Uh, but later on we found out precisely what it was, and that is, it's the number of G's that you can survive in the barred shock test. And I'll tell you about the barred shock test in a little bit. Okay, uh, let's talk about the parts. Now this is a, an A version, it's a nuclear version. I'll tell you briefly about some of the others. But this had a big guide set up in the nose here that consisted of a stable platform, a couple of accelerometers, a radar altimeter, a computer and a memory. 
with not enough memory. Uh, <laughs> which this was, all this equipment was taken from a, an existing, I think it was an F-15 fighter guidance set. We've been using that for a long time. All right, then the next thing is the nuclear warhead. Now, I don't want anybody making sketches of this because it's probably secret, <laughs> but it was a thing on the internet that already. came in like this, and that's the nuke warhead. And it attached more or less to the, to the guidance set. And uh, the guidance set was wonderful, <coughs> except that it heated up. And of course, the Navy wanted to turn it on and run it for hours in the submarine and the torpedo tube. We told them, well, you can't do that. And they said, we got to. We do that. We turn everything on and let it run until it gets too hot. And they said, all right, we'll fix that. So this is all fuel back here, all the way back to the end. And we use that fuel circulated it through the guidance set. That was pretty scary to some of the people that didn't like to have fuel in guidance sets. <laughs> but we did it anyway, and it hasn't blown up yet. Has it blown up yet, Terry? I don't think so. <laughs> OK, well, it's, it's going fine. Then. And uh, you could run the missile for three hours in the tube and be cool. So that was kind of a good thing. They liked that. Okay, so we got the guidance set now. Nothing much happens in this area behind the guidance set. Until you get to station 100, which I don't know where that is, it's probably about here. And in the, in the uh, fuel tank, there's a bubble. And it's inside of a a keeper with holes in it. And uh, the point here is that's a rubber <coughs> bubble. And it, it contains the air and gives some place for the uh, fuel to expand and contract. And the Navy said, we don't want any fumes or fuel in the submarine. And I can see why that is because a lot of the sailors sleep on the missiles up on the torpedoes and so forth. It's very comfortable. They can spread out and they didn't want to be in there with, that, with a lot of fuel stinking around. Well, this, this uh, bubble, there was a, uh, a range of temperature that it had to go to. And I don't remember what the upper temperature was. Do you, Jerry? No. But I remember distinctly what the lower temperature was because it set the size of this bubble because at the lower temperature the bubble collapsed down and uh, this was all there and the temperature was minus 65 degrees so I thought about that a little bit and finally a dumb me I asked a question I said, what's the submarine doing when the <coughs> water outside is minus 65? It must be kind of draggy going through that solid ice. <laughs> he said, oh, you don't understand. He says, what we're worried about is some sailor leaving this on a dock up in Alaska somewhere and letting it cold soak for a week. And it could get to minus 65. So, okay, we, we went ahead. But this was a real real loss in fuel, we hated, we hated that. All right, behind this, here's that station 100. We put a couple of, couple of wings in here. And they were stacked one above the other. You know, there was right and left. And, uh, so our poor engineers started trying to make that work. And uh, it was very difficult to get these things out and get them lined up. But anyway, they worked and worked. So finally I said, okay, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna let them stick out that 
they're not going to be even. They're going to go be up and down. Remember that, Jerry? I remember it well. The Bureau guys hated that. They absolutely hated that because there was some unknown thing going to happen as a result of the wings being off cocked a little bit. And the other thing was we simplified the mechanism and the wings came out. One came out first. The other one kind of followed along. And we figured, well, uh, the missile's going to do a little wiggle while that's happening. And uh, it did. But I said, listen, what are you guys worried about? There's no little, little old lady in there drinking a martini that's going to spill it <coughs> when the missile does its thing. I'm running out of wet here. So is everything very clear so far? Those are the wings, <clears throat> and uh, they work. They still work. Well, the only thing was, <clears throat> Jerry said they only needed to be eight square feet <clears throat> theoretical area of the wings. That gave the most range. This made everybody very nervous because when you look at something flying with an eight square foot wing, theoretical, most of the wings in the body, there's no wing at all, it just sticks out a little bit. And that was right, he was right, it would fly further. But the Navy said, no, that's un-Navy, that wing's too small. So he made us put uh, 12 square foot wings on it. So it's a little bit less range than we hoped for. Okay. We're, we're moving aft. The next, the next uh, section is after the wings here is another section. These are all break points where you can actually pull a missile apart. And uh, they have to be very, very carefully designed and made so that it doesn't leak. And so that takes this 200G lateral load. You guys think very much of a 200G lateral load? That's a, that's a whale of a load, I'll tell you. Okay, so the next thing behind here was the inlet, the engine inlet. And it was a fiberglass inlet that folded up inside. And the reason we went to that was that we heard all kinds of stories about turbofan engines stalling and doing various bad things, right? And uh, so we decided we'd have a nice, good inlet with lots of, lots of uh, dynamic pressure on it. And there was a foundry layer bleed in here to bleed that off. The, the, you know, you think of everything has got to be stealthy nowadays. Well, on cruise missile in the beginning, there was only two things that were stealthy. One was the inlet had a little bit of treatment up in the boundary layer bleed and on the face of the engine. The thing that was giving us trouble there was the, the dome on the front of the engine. 
So we had to treat that. But that was the only two things that we, we fooled with. We found out that if anybody saw a tomahawk going at Mach 7 tenths at 50 feet off the ground, they wouldn't have seen anything other than that it was gone. It was the, that was the way it was. We did a lot of experiments with people trying to spot them. Nobody could ever spot them. Okay, so we got the good, good inlet. We tried all kinds of inlets because that was taking some of our fuel space. And uh, I'll never forget, the best one was a rubber inlet, an inflatable one. Looked just like the fiberglass one, except it was double wall, and we wouldn't put it down and inflate it. Didn't take up much room in the missile when we did that. But the damn engineers, engineers always do bad things. And they started calling it the flubber inlet. So we decided that we weren't going to go out with a, something that had an inlet called flubber. So all right, we're, now we're back here to the, to the engine. See, this all has to fit together. Let's say the engine's here. Well, you know, as Jerry pointed out, I had been working on the B-36 and a whole lot of stuff big, everything big, you know. And I couldn't get my mind wrapped around this engine. This engine was a 600 pound thrust engine initially. And uh, the inlet diameter, 12 inches. It was a pretty small engine, and it was very unique in certain aspects. One was all of the, the blading, the compressor blading, the turbine blading, was made out of single pieces of metal, either high temp or low temp. The forward uh, compressor blades were made out of an aluminum disc, and they machined the blades on the disc, all one piece, they weren't loose parts. So that was, saved a little cost and was fairly easy to do. And so it was a dual spool engine in that we had a compressor and a turbine hooked together with a shaft, another shaft outside of it with a centrifugal compressor and a turbine. And it was quite a thing. It was built <coughs> by Williams Company. Mr. Williams had been working on jets, on turbines for Chrysler back there in Detroit. And uh, Chrysler gave up the turbines in their cars. And so he was free to do something. And what he wanted to do was build engines. And he did. And initially, he built engines. One of the things he built for was the guy that puts the engine on his back from the straps and flies around, well, that was one of these engines in the early days. Okay. I think, oh, the booster. We've got to have a booster. You forgot about that. This booster here was mostly propellant. And uh, an initiator down in here. <coughs> and the good thing about it was it had paddles that, that went went into the jet, and this provided uh, <coughs> added, uh, pitch and yaw control. They were very simple little paddles that went in there, sort of. A little bit like the V2 along those lines. And uh, so that was the booster. William uh, Atlantic Research built that for us. So that's the, that's the missile. That's all the pieces of the missile that amount to anything. And so now the next thing I'd like to 
talk about is the launch sequence. The launch sequence was everything was in the tube, in the capsule, and uh, they decide to launch. The first thing they do <coughs> is the petty officer third class that was launching this nuclear missile would uh, call up the missile and say, what are you? That was always a very important thing to do because nobody would remember what was in what tube and so forth and so on. So the missile itself would respond and say, oh, I'm a nuclear warhead missile. And he'd say, oh, good, that's what I needed. So, and he'd start getting ready to launch it. He'd turn on the guidance set and start the cooling system going and uh, getting ready. The first thing that would happen is that we would put water around the around the missile, or rather around the, the uh, capsule, fill that with water out there, seawater presumably, and uh, it would go to the pressure of the outside pressure around the boat. I'm not allowed to tell you how deep the boat was, I don't think, even to this day. Several hundred feet. Is that close? Okay. Several hundred feet. And we'd be ready to go. And they'd load a, a mission into the into the missile. And the miss the mission the uh, the mission I'll tell you about in a minute. So it's in there and they get ready to launch and they launch and what happens is that a hydraulic pressure is applied back through the capsule and against the back of the missile and it would tear up or break four bolts back there and the missile would start moving and it would go out through a, a sealed member in the front and off it would go. Well, the next thing the Navy worried about more than anything was what's called circular run. And they think they had a couple of circular runs during World War II, where the torpedo comes out and makes a complete circle and hits its own submarine. And that's very bad. They don't like that at all. In fact, they very rarely found anybody that remembers it. One guy got blown off the conning tower and he survived, so he said it was a circular run. So we had to get into this circular run business, and you can imagine launching a nuclear bomb out of the front of the submarine through a torpedo tube, making sure it doesn't have a circular run. Well, the guidance said it's running, so it, it kind of tells everything where it is so relative to the submarine. That's good. The other thing is there's a timing requirement for it. And uh, I knew that if there was a certain length of time, if you got to that time, you were out there. But the real, the real one was a Navy invention called the string. And we, we thought, you guys are nuts, but we went ahead with it anyway. And that is that there's a, a heavy cord, a little can on the back of the booster, and the missile goes. It feeds this cord out and goes out to the end. It's a 41-foot cord, very important, 41 feet. And when it gets to the end of the cord, it yanks a switch in the missile and says, I'm 41 feet out from the submarine. It's great, like the booster. So they would light the booster at that point and it would begin to climb up to the surface due to hydrodynamics mainly. And uh, it would, uh, it wasn't roll controlled. It was free to roll wherever it was gonna roll because we had no control to roll it. And uh, it would come up to the surface, and the minute it accelerated out of the surface, it would get a little blip on the guidance set. The guidance set 
sit and say, okay, I've come to the surface, I'm ready to go. And then the first thing that would happen is the fins would come out. And the fins had aerodynamic capability to control roll. So the guidance set started telling, well, which, the guidance set remembered which way was up, which was kind of handy because you don't want to dive or anything like that. And so the minute it knew which way was up, it would start putting the wings out. And it used wings and booster during this time to make a climb. And the inlet was either open or not open, I don't remember, but it doesn't matter because it's not doing anything. <coughs> and it would get on up there, and then, then there would be another little acceleration bump, which meant that the booster had burned out. And the booster would be dropped then at that point. It's cut off somewhere. Yeah, the, the tail of the uh, missile would come down here and there was a horrendous cutting charge between the booster and the missile. And that would go off and cut this loose. Better than that. And then there was another very exciting thing up in here that was a guillotine. It had a big blade in it. A little like Napoleon's guillotine. And all the harness, electrical harness, ran through that guillotine. And at the time that the booster was disconnected, the guillotine would chop down and hopefully chop through all the electrical systems. And this was kind of a problem. We ran into a lot of a lot of development on that, but it worked finally. All right. Now, Turcom. Talk a minute about TURCOM. TURCOM is the guidance laws that were in the missile. And boy, when the GPS came out, I thought I'd gone to heaven. We can eliminate all that nonsense from the TURCOM and the G GPS. Well, it didn't take long before the Navy said, no, no, that's not what we got, what we got in mind. We want you to keep TURCOM and add GPS as kind of a, a reference to it. We're not going to really use GPS yet. And I fear that they're afraid of blocking the, the <coughs> GPS signal. They don't want to get into that mode that all their tomahawks are down because the signal's blocked. So anyway, we still carry TURCOM. TURCOM, pretty clever thing, I thought. It had patches of ground. The missile would fly into the beach and you'd find <coughs> a patch somewhere. Now, a patch had to have a little bit of mountains and yeah, valleys and things in order to be a good patch. It had to have some character, in other words. And so the missile would go across that patch and it would using that altimeter would measure the al altitude all the way across the patch. And then it would take that strip of altitude and the computer would compare it with every other strip it had in the, the mission and it would say, oh hey, you're 1,200 feet to the left of where you ought to be. The, the real strip is over here, move over. So as it came out of the patch, the missile would move over and get online again. And we keep, there were all kinds of patches, well, there are four or five patches on the way to a target. And as you went, the patches get smaller and the bumps and so forth would be on smaller <coughs> scale. So we were gradually getting more and more accurate as we got to the target. And uh, that was pretty good, especially for nukes. You didn't have to get too accurate with a nuke. You just set it off and everything got blown up. So uh, the, that system alone, the TURCOM, would, would do the job. <coughs> All right. All right, we made several models of Tomahawk. 
One was the one I showed you, the new. We built an anti-ship version, which had a radar in the front for hitting ships. The Navy loved that. They loved to hit ships. And so they were all enthused about that. And I don't think they've used it very much. We went out here to San Clemente Island and sunk a couple of old ships out there. And it worked beautiful, boy. It turned out, though, it was a little disappointing. Uh, <coughs> It had a bullpup warhead in it, 1,000 pound. And that was pretty neat when it would hit a ship, it would put a big hole in it. But it turned out if there was any fuel left in the missile, that fuel would get in there and spread around in a compartment. And when it went off, it was really as effective as the bullpup warhead. So that was kind of a good thing. I didn't tell you about the fuel. The fuel in the missile is dimer fuel. I don't guess any of you guys use that in your cars, but it's a high-density fuel. It has more BTUs per <coughs> cubic inch in it than kerosene. It, it resembles kerosene. So we use that because we get more range that way, more BTUs in the fuel. All right, so we're ready now. Any ship had this radar. Then my favorite was the submunition, it was the D version. And it was uh, quite a thing, it held about 166 submunitions, about the size of a family soup can. And uh, it could fly over various kinds of targets, like revetted aircraft and anti-aircraft targets. And it could dispense those munitions in any any way it needed to, either multiple targets or single big target. And the, the Blue 97, which was our favorite, one of the soup can ones, it would be tossed out of there with an airbag. It would be tossed out of seven, seven units in a bag, it would get out away from the missile and it would break again and break down to all the single ones would come out. And it would head down to wherever it was going. And it had a balut. And uh, the balut was a, is a sort of a form of parachute. would stabilize it and would head down. And the first thing it hit, if it was a tank or a armored car, uh, it had a shaped charge in the front and put a nice two-inch hole through the armor and squirt around on the inside. So that was pretty good. And uh, it also had a uh, fragmentary <coughs> warhead behind that. And then behind that, it had a pyrotechnic warhead. So it was a triple effect bomblet that really did a pretty good job. Now, I don't know how many of them have been used. We built them, and they were uh, put in storage. And I even think, possibly, that they just used one over there in uh, Libya, but I'm not sure. They don't tell me all this. <laughs> and uh, then we have a very famous one. Uh, we tried selling missiles to the Air Force. Well, the Air Force, they don't care if it's made of solid gold. If the Navy designed it and built it, they're really not interested. You know? They build their own missile. It's a very, very tight thing. But one time we we sold them the Glickham ground launch cruise missile, and it was an air. It was sold to the Air Force, basically the same, similar to the A I was just talking about here, and uh, Jerry put those in trailers over in Europe and. Italy and all over the place, and towed them around, scared the hell out of the Russians, <laughs> having these missiles being towed around everywhere. So finally, I guess, in a, in a word, the Russians said, hey, look, if you will quit doing that, we'll eliminate our small missiles, and we'll both do away with those, because we don't like those clickings. So, Someday, Jerry, I'll have to tell you about eliminating the glickums and sawing them up. That was the best one of all. 
All right. Then there was one other thing I worked on briefly called Subhawk. And it was a complete anti-submarine system in a missile. And you'd launch it from a submarine out in the general direction of where you thought an uh, enemy submarine <coughs> is. It would go out there and uh, launch some sonoboys, make a big circle and measure the reply from the sonoboys and uh, finally locate the enemy submarine. And when it got it located, it would dive and hit it underwater. So uh, it was pretty exciting, except the Navy says it's too sophisticated. We don't want that. <coughs> so we gave, up, gave that up. Now testing, oh, we, had, we did tests. I can't believe how many tests we did of various things. One of the early ones was ejecting the capsule. This capsule, uh, after the missile's gone, can be ejected out the torpedo tube, empty capsule. <clears throat> and there were people in the Navy and other places that said, boy, that baby's gonna hit the submarine. It's gonna go out there and clang against the submarine and make a big dent. So he said, oh, no, no. So we did little scale model tests and analysis and so forth. And finally, we went to uh, Narragansett Bay up in Rhode Island with a full-scale capsule. And there's a ship up there. It looks sort of like Mr. Roberts' supply ship in the movies, you know. It has some torpedo tubes way down underneath the water level. And we used it, and we were shooting capsules. And lo and behold, they came out of there zipping, and uh, they went off and sunk very nicely out of the way. So the Navy finally decided with those tests that uh, that was good enough. And then we did a full-scale engine running wind tunnel test, also Jerry. And uh, that was great. We put it in the Tullahoma Tunnel turned the engine on, measured everything, you know, the way aerodynamicists do. And it was, we got a lot of data. And then we combined that with uh, analytical data and with uh, flight data. And I think the Tomahawk has the best description of drag and things that aerodynamicists stay awake night worrying about. And uh, it was great. Very good. Uh, another test, oh, this is the one, the barge shock test. It was super. There's a big old barge up in San Francisco Bay at the Navy Yard. There used to be a Navy Yard up there. And uh, the missiles went in this barge on a rack that was similar to the rack that's on the submarine. Terrible rack, by the way. Anyway, they went on there and be cinched down on the rack, and we cinched down a tomahawk on, on the rack, and we looked, and lo and behold, there was another missile in in the in the barge. We thought, well, that's okay. The Navy's trying to take advantage of this because what would happen is they have a string of depth charges, and they'd start firing them, the furthest one working their way in slowly. And uh, we were looking inside the barge. There was a television camera or something and lights. And every time the depth charge would go off, it would lift this big barge out of the water a couple of inches and drop it back down in. And the dirt and dust and everything in there. It was quite, a, quite an affair. And they started coming in closer and closer. Pretty soon, we were watching. And this other missile fell apart. It just broke in the middle and dropped on the deck and dumped all the fuel on the deck, which was water. Of course, they didn't use fuel. <clears throat> but this was a Mark 48 torpedo, <coughs> the Navy's finest, most modern torpedo. It just broke in half. Tomahawk was sitting over there not doing anything. He was just sitting there holding the submarine together. <laughs> That's what we used to accuse it of. You get our get that capsule strapped down to the rack, 
it was holding submarine together. <coughs> so anyway, that, that was good. We passed. We were either the first or the only uh, weapon that ever got grade A shock rating. That is, it, it passed the shock to the point where you could launch it after it went through that shock. Now, we never really measured whether that was 200 Gs or not, but it was enough. And we decided it passed. Okay. Oh, parachutes. I forgot to tell you that we, uh, in the early part of the program, we were in direct competition with another with another uh, company, LPV, Ling Temco Vought, and they were building a missile as well. And they were, they had a lot of trouble. One of the troubles was they had built the original submarine launched, what was the name of that thing, Jerry? Launched from a submarine. So they said, oh, submarine? Yeah. no, no. Huh? I want to say Talos, but that... No. Anyway, they built one, and they were very proud of that. And their attitude during this competition was, hey, we've already built one of those things, you know. Why do we have to go through this test program, have all these tests and so forth? Well, uh, let's see, the, our sponsor back in Washington was <coughs> Commander Locke, who ended up Admiral Locke, so I never know how to refer to him. He's, he was probably about at, at uh, captain at this point. And uh, so one of the things we did, we had to test the parachute. We had a parachute system that went in place of the bullpup. I'm confused, but. Up in here, the bull the bull pup was a, a thousand pound. Doesn't want to work. Turn it upside down. Yeah, good idea. No, not a good idea. Anyway, there's a bunch of them on the board there. Okay, I have to use a color. Let's see, where am I? Oh, oh, a test. We put a, we take a section of the missile out where the warhead was and put this so-called REM in there, recovery exercise module. And, and it weighed the same as the thousand pound warhead, but it had a parachute in it and a lot of ballast and uh, telemetry and so forth. And uh, they wanted to test that, the Navy did, especially the parachute aspect of it. So we said, okay. So we went out to El Paso. That's the word, no, not El Paso. What's closer than El Paso? Phoenix. We went out near Phoenix and uh, did a test of the parachute system. They flew over and dropped their unit. And the parachute was needed, opened and did all the things it was supposed to do. And we used that during all the test program. We would fly these missiles many times because of that. Like one of them flew seven times. We recovered it and did a little bit of repair work on the fins and <coughs> it again. But anyway, we were supposed to test it, so we tested it. Then we were in competition with LTV, and they were doing the same tests that we were in general. And one of them was their, their parachute test. So I said, well, look, we gotta find out what happens to them. We weren't supposed to, it was kind of a spy mission. We were constantly listening to them on the radio and doing various things that were legal, but not quite, and hearing what they were doing. So I took these two engineers and I said, say, would you like a nice picnic in the desert? He said, oh yeah, we'd love that, you know. So I rented them a Jeep and sent them out. And uh, I said, now get as close to this test as you can get. And uh, 
radio, radio us back what's going on. So they went out there. And good old LTV made the world's biggest mistake. It's something that, in fact, that guys tried to get me to do it on ours and I wouldn't do it. And that is put an emergency chute on this test thing. And that's not what you want to do. So they went up and dropped it. And lo and behold, the chute kind of came out, the main chute. But the emergency chute came out too. So the thing kind of wrapped up into the sand. And since that was a one, they did it twice, did the same general thing, and we were pretty happy about that. <laughs> so those are some of the tests that we did. Now, the construction. How are we doing on time? <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Has your damn airplane flown in yet? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think the airplane's in. Anyway, this is a this missile is all aluminum welded. And the way we did that, I used to go out in the shop and walk through the shop every noontime. I was eating my celery stick walking through the shop and I saw this this rib that kind of resembled that wooden one up there on the the thing. Well it was aluminum. Beautiful rib. He, Everything cut out very nicely, and perfect. And I checked around a little. It was a, it was a, what do you call it? A, a automatic machine job. They just put it in the machine, and turn it on, and out it comes. And so I thought, man, we could use that. So we got into that, and we started getting forging, round forging thick. And, put, and putting them in the Tershon machine. We bought a machine, we put the thing in there, and the cutter would go in and put all the stiffeners and everything in there. Very neat, very nice, and uh, a lot of chips, by the way. But the trouble with it, it was great. And then you'd weld the bulkheads on with electron beam welding, which had no effect, no what you call it, warping and so forth. Very small heat affected zone. And uh, that was good, but the thing was that our St. Louis Board of Directors would come out occasionally and they'd look us over and we, they'd say, well, you guys are wearing lousy ties. You ought to be wearing different ties and <laughs> on and on. <clears throat> but the favorite thing was, boy, that machining, all that aluminum, it's a terrible expense. So we say, well, no, sir, it isn't a terrible expense because the, it goes in the machine and comes out the part. <coughs> Nobody's messing with it. There's no machinist messing with it very much. And so they wouldn't buy that. So they said, we're going to build one out of aluminum sheet, like a, a good airplane should be with rivets. <laughs> and so we said, OK, we'll do that for you. So we built a center section like that. And of course, it had a few problems, like it leaked like a sieve <laughs> around all these rivets, especially the nut, the nut plates. And the other problem was that when you got through driving all these rivets, kabang, 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 uh, it turned into a banana. Now, not very much, but just enough so it wouldn't fit in the torpedo tube. So that was bad. So they tried that every time, you know, and we'd go back. Then they'd say, well, look at all those chips you're making. Lord, that costs a lot of money. I said, well, yeah, but we sweep up all those chips and send them back to the forging guy, and he makes a new forging out of them. So they were kind of stuck on that. OK, well, I'm getting the signal. I'm going to wind, I'm going to wind up here. Uh, and wind up is that now attack submarines are real ships for the Navy. They used to just shoot uh, torpedoes at enemy ships. Well, there are no enemy ships, so they don't shoot torpedoes at them. They just kind of sail around. And one of the reasons I wore this hat is they really love to look through the periscope and things. That's the main thing they were doing. But now they can launch Tomahawks 1,300 miles. And that's pretty good from a submarine. All the missiles that I think were launched down in Libya 
were out of a submarine. And uh, the other thing is the destroyers now all have them too. And the assignment of a nice Arleigh Burke destroyer used to be to follow around behind an aircraft carrier in case he needed to be protected, air, air protection, you know. Well, that was a terrible job. Now they're full of tomahawks, and they can do a job against the land target quicker and better than the airplane, excuse me, airplanes on the carrier. <laughs> but that's where we're headed. So that's the end of my, uh, oh, why is this damn thing called a tomahawk? I mean, that seems really strange, doesn't it? So what we did, we used to make movies, send them back to Washington, and this one was a beautiful movie, color. Uh, we put a camera on the lower fin and go, you know. And so the, the guy that made the movie just said, well, look, I'm going to add some music to this in the background. So we said, okay, that'll be fine, they'll love that. So he added boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Indian music in the back. And so that was fine, it sounded good, you know. So uh, pretty soon I get an emergency telephone call from, I guess, Captain Locke. And he says, don't ever do that. He says, this has got nothing to do with an Indian. And I said, what? what do you mean, nothing to do with an Indian? He says, well, this tomahawk is a British boarding axe. The British Navy had them so that when they boarded enemy ships, they could chop the rigging and chop the people as well, and they called them tomahawks. Okay, so the American Navy, of course, picked up on that. They wanted to be just as good as the British Navy. And uh, two guys leaning on a rail of American ship early on, they said, hey, look at that Indian back in the woods back there. He's chopping a piece of wood with a stick and a stone on the end. He's got a tomahawk back there. So it wasn't the Indians naming us. It was us naming the Indians the tomahawk. <laughs> <laughs>